Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera. Your look at the world of business and economics this week. The cost of riots in France adding up. The nation has massive debt and aims to restore public finances. So can it spend its way out of the crisis? Also this week, as the wheels of electric cars spin, the race for lithium heats up. Plus, Botswana's sparkling diamond deal, the African nation getting a bigger share of its gems after tense negotiations with mining company De Beers. Thousands of cars torched, countless shops looted and banks attacked during several nights of riots in France. The unrest over the shooting of a 17-year-old by the police is estimated to have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, the fallout is yet another challenge for President Emmanuel Macron. He's already faced months of protests against pension reforms. But the nation is drowning in debt and aims to cut spending. Finda Monaghan reports. Parisian business owners are taking stock of the damage. This suburb has seen nights of rioting and looting after the police shooting of a 17-year-old. Some locals who sympathize say this isn't the right way to bring about change. All this damage won't bring a solution. We have to find democratic responses. We have to respect the law. You can't just create chaos. Who ends up suffering? It's the poorest. It's us working people. It wasn't just businesses that were attacked. Stadiums were damaged. Cars set on fire. The cost is expected to run into the hundreds of millions. The government has announced measures to help struggling retailers. We've asked companies to reduce insurance deductibles as much as possible. We've also asked the French Banking Federation to show the utmost understanding in terms of handling due payments for retailers and entrepreneurs who may have been affected by these acts of vandalism. French President Emmanuel Macron has met with local officials. But many feel not enough is being done. It's not the local elected officials who are responsible for this tension and damage. And we are waiting for action on city policy, as there has been no direction from the government for too long. The latest unrest comes as France faces a range of economic challenges. Macron's attempts to get public finances in order have been met with strikes and protests, particularly his push to raise the age of retirement. Government spending was high during the pandemic, and public debt has passed more than $3 trillion. Credit agencies are wary. Some already downgraded France in April, and they're warning that unrest and instability could hamper attempts to rein in the deficit and get the economy growing. Vincent Monaghan for Counting the Cost. Well, joining me now from Paris is Philippe Wichter. Philippe is Chief Economist at Ostrom Asset Management. Good to have you with us. So, Philippe, Take us through the economic fallout of the riots so far. Not too much, you know. We, uh, uh, the, instead, the French institution, uh, uh, statistical institution, did, uh, did a lot of uh, uh, research on uh, what happens when there are riots, when there are strikes. And what we see is a very short-term effect. But after that, we have a catch-up, and uh, uh, the, the situation is smoother than what we can expect when we are in, uh, in these riots or in these trials. So there is no, uh, not a real issue at the end uh, with this situation. All right, so the impact not that big, but whether we're talking about strikes or riots, I mean, all of this really exposing some of the social, underlying social tensions. Can France afford to address particularly some of the issues which prompted the riots, like housing, education, and so on, those kinds of inequalities? Now, there are two things to, to, to keep in mind with, when you, you discuss the French society. There's the economic side, and uh, it works well. Uh, we are not in recession. We won't, probably we won't be in recession this year. Uh, but at the same time, we well, are... Credit rating real, agencies, and uh, sorry, let me jump in, but credit rating agencies, they are sounding the alarm over the level of debt, right? Even if, as you said, the economy is not in recession. That's, that's the point. We, we have social issues uh, and the riots we had uh, this week and, uh, and the week before was associated with this 
uh, the, the, social, the social issue. Uh, the government has tried for years uh, to limit the impact of uh, these uh, social imbalances. They spend a lot, they reduce uh, taxes, and as a, fa as a matter of fact, we, we had a, a lot of debt. And that's, that's a real uh, question. We, uh, we were mentioned in a, you know, in a, uh, by Fitch or by Standard Poor's, uh, all these uh, uh, agencies that uh, uh, give a note to uh, uh, a rate to, to, to the French economy. We saw that public finance was at the center of their, uh, of their worries. Uh, and this is clearly a, uh, an issue, and we, we don't know exactly how to manage that. Uh, we, we have a lot of debt, we have very high public deficit, but it's a, a consequence of these uh, uh, social imbalances, imbalances. We need to, uh, to have uh, a lot of funds to uh, limit the, uh, the impact of these uh, imbalances, but at the same time, it has impact, macroeconomic impact on, the, on that. So, that's so, the, so hang on, uh, so France is really but... caught between these two forces, right? I mean, the finance minister is promising to put finances back on track. But to do that, does that mean further cuts in social spending and, and more inequality problems? That's, a, that's one important point. What we saw in the past is that the uh, finance minister is always uh, looking for uh, a balanced budget. But at the end, it's very, very difficult because the, uh, the French society is not balanced by itself. Uh, and so we need to, uh, to spend a lot. And um, uh, that the, the, we, you know, we, we are on the rather age uh, in, in France on this, uh, on this issue. We have a, a kind of strong economy, but at the same time, uh, a lot of social issues. And the government and Macron, the President Macron, uh, tried to balance the two, uh, the two elements. We had a, a reform on retirement, what, which was necessary because uh, more and more people will go on retirement. And so we need to, uh, to, to, to fund uh, the retirement scheme. So it was necessary to, to, to change the, uh, uh, the situation. But at the same time, um, we, uh, uh, we, we, we need to, uh, uh, to put more money in other, uh, in other part of the economy, in education, uh, uh, in all these, uh, uh, these points. And that's why it's very, it's very complicated. In, uh, so what's in the France bottom line then, Philippe? Is that, as you put it, balancing act by the government, is it failing? Where does that leave economic growth? No, growth is still robust. It's not a strong growth, but it's still robust. And uh, we have a, a plan that, is, that has been uh, put in place by uh, President Macron, which is called France 2030, uh, which tried to, uh, uh, to boost uh, growth in France in, uh, uh, through innovation, through education, and it starts working. Uh, that's very, uh, very important. And at the same time, the level of employment has not been uh, as high as it is now in the past. So we have very positive uh, situation, but we have all these social imbalances. And that's why the situation from outside uh, is complicated to, to understand. It's hard to understand in France, but it's much more uh, difficult to understand from outside. But we have some uh, uh, strong uh, momentum on uh, innovation, on jobs, jobs creation, etc. So the, uh, uh, the situation is not that bad, and not as bad as the uh, uh, riots could uh, say uh, for, for people outside France. Been great talking to you, Philippe. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's dubbed the white gold. Lithium is critical to the production of electric vehicles and smartphones. But EV sales are growing around the world, and demand for the metal could outstrip production by the end of the decade. With governments racing to meet their renewable energy goals, mining firms and car makers are now scrambling to lock in more supplies. 
Chinese companies and Russian firms will now invest more than $1 billion in the extraction of the metal in Bolivia. That follows a similar major deal by Chinese battery maker CATL in January. China dominates the lithium supply chain. The US and Europe trying to catch up. Meanwhile, car makers like General Motors and Ford have taken the rare step of buying stakes in mining firms, bypassing traditional suppliers. According to the US Geological Survey, there are 98 million metric tons of lithium globally. Nearly 60% is in three Latin American nations, Bolivia, Chile and Argentina, known as the Lithium Triangle. Global lithium production is led by Australia, Chile, China and Argentina. They comprise more than 95% combined. But Beijing controls nearly 60% of the world's lithium processing through its network of refineries. The US has only one working mine, despite being rich in the metal. Washington has recently introduced a new bill, which includes tax credits on EVs that source their battery raw materials domestically. Europe plans to ease regulatory barriers to open its mines, but the move is opposed by campaigners concerned about environmental and social harm. In northern Argentina, there are vast amounts of lithium. Indigenous communities fear mining companies are eroding their land rights. Many people in the province of Jujuy have taken their fight to the streets. Michael Appel reports. <laughs> Members of this indigenous community in northern Argentina have been blocking roads for days. They're worried by what they see as a threat to their livelihoods. Constitutional reforms that could open up their land to exploitation by lithium companies. We're fighting for our rights to be respected as the original communities that have lived here for many years. We want the governor to revoke the new constitution and to resign. For decades, indigenous communities have survived off cattle, tourism and salt. They say all of these could be undermined by large-scale mining. All this conflict is happening here. It's unusual for us. We are not used to this and we are so afraid. They want to change laws and as usual, we won't have any rights. The constitutional reform has sparked violence. Recently, the government tried to move protesters by force Dozens of people were injured. The governor says he's put two of the articles that are of concern to the indigenous communities on hold. We have gone to the community, and if they think we will run them over, we won't. We have gone back to the two articles that concern them, and we will revise them. Communities remain on alert. They are certain that development in the region will come at their expense. Mike Lappel for counting the cost. From Washington, D.C. now, I'm joined by Chris Berry. Chris is the founder and president of research and advisory firm House Mountain Partners. Good to have you with us. So, Chris, the whole idea of renewable energy, right, it's one of the main things. It's supposed to be about protecting the environment. But is it creating a new set of challenges for the environment because of the need, its need for lithium? Well, I, I think it certainly is, and, and thank you for having me. I call it the paradox of green growth in the sense that we all want to decarbonize and we want to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, but you know we're not going to do this with fewer or less natural resources. We're going to have to use many, many more of lithium in particular. Um, and so you know that's the real challenge. We could think of using perhaps certain technologies to bring more resources above ground or battery recycling, for example. But the bottom line is neither of those two options are going to fill any potential gap. We're going to need a lot more lithium in the next 10 years. All right, let's uh, bring in a little bit of a political angle to this discussion. Now we're seeing some Latin American countries kind of taking a lot more control over lithium companies, bringing that more under state control. How does that impact the concerns about the environment? How does it impact the concerns about social justice and making sure benefits reach the people? Well, I think this is, you know, if we take Chile as a case study, you know, they, they have laid out a national lithium strategy. Their plan, the Chilean government's plan, is to take a much more active role in the lithium supply chain. Of course, Chile is one of the largest lithium producers in the world and is likely to stay that way 
for many, many years. And I think President Boric in particular has realized, listen, you know, we have companies like SQM and Albemarle that are mining lithium from Solars in the Atacama Desert. And most of that value, once the lithium is mined, that value is realized elsewhere, whether or not it's battery production in Asia or other parts of the world. And so these national lithium strategies or maybe quasi resource nationalism would be another way to think about it is in, in the case of Chile, the government's answer to try and share the wealth a little bit more. But again, this is going to cause, I think, tension with respect to foreign direct investment coming into Chile. I mean, for example, if you were thinking about exploring and perhaps developing a lithium asset in Chile and you knew that a portion of your asset, a portion of your value was going to go to the state in terms of ownership, you may think twice about investing in Chile. Maybe you'll think about Argentina or even parts of Africa, I think, are really going to have to step up for lithium production in the future here. So, you know, the good thing about lithium is that it's not rare. Uh, you could find it in turn in hard rock sources, for example, in Western Australia, or again, the lithium triangle, uh, which is Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Uh, again, two main portions of, of lithium production uh, globally. So it's not rare. Uh, the good news, the bad news, or maybe the more challenging news is we have to build out the remainder of the supply chain in order to really decarbonize. And that is what the remainder of the supply chain, the refining, the battery production is what China dominates currently. I'm glad you mentioned China. So there is this competition, isn't there, between China and the US. The Chinese and Russian uh, interests have made lithium investments in Bolivia. Is this going to strengthen the relative advantage, particularly that China has when it comes to the lithium market? Well, I think it will be a number of years, perhaps a decade, before you see any true decoupling, certainly with respect to lithium. I mean, as an example, if you think about the full lithium supply chain, China mines about 13% of lithium globally, but they refine, in other words, take that raw lithium and convert it into what we call battery grade lithium. They refine about 60% of the global total. And by the way, today, lithium is about a 900,000, maybe 1 million ton per year market. And then as you go further down the supply chain, whether or not it's battery manufacturing or recycling, they own well over 70 to 80% of those markets. And so, again, you could sort of say, well, this is what the nationalization strategy is designed to do, uh, capture more value in specific countries. And of course, the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States is a full on kind of frontal assault to try and ring, if you will, some of that dominance away from China. But again, it's going to take probably 10 years. Can they I would do argue, it, Chris? Can the, US, can the US catch up or is it simply too far behind now when it comes to the its position in the lithium market? Well, China, China has been building this supply chain. And again, we're just talking about lithium. You could look at nickel. You could look at rare earth elements. You could look at a number of 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 raw materials, critical raw materials, uh, they've been doing this for 10 or 15 years. I mean, you can go back and, and look at old five-year plans, and they talk about having electric vehicles, as an example, and grid development as strategic imperatives. And one of the things that the Chinese did was basically went outward bound with their checkbook and locked up uh, natural resources, locked up lithium in Africa, locked up lithium in Ar Argentina or Australia, as an example. And so for the rest of the world to catch up, whether or not it's North America or the European Union or, or wherever, um, we're going to have to effectively mimic that strategy. We're going to have to sort of think, I, I would argue, take a public-private partnership, so governments and the private sector locking down natural resources and trying to expedite the development in, in order to be able to catch up. All right, and coming back to the point of how some of the, the countries which host these minerals like lithium try to bring more state control over the, the process, the production chain and the processing chain. And you mentioned that, well, this might drive away some of the investors who might go to another country instead. Can, they, can the idea of a cartel, something along the lines of OPEC, mitigate that risk for mineral host countries and help them to, to get more benefit for them and their people? Perhaps, you know, the, the idea of a battery metals OPEC has been floated. I know I think Indonesia, with respect to nickel, has talked about that specifically. Um, I wouldn't be too optimistic about seeing a lithium OPEC or a battery metals OPEC anytime soon. I mean, 
these markets, the supply chain for lithium, for example, is is very widely dispersed. Um, and because of that, I think, you know, it would take an awful long time to really consolidate and concentrate that power. All right. Well, we haven't spent long enough talking to you. It's been a great conversation. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. The discovery of diamonds in 1966 helped turn Botswana into Africa's sixth richest country. But nearly 70 percent of its rough diamonds go to Belgian mining firm De Beers. Well, the government has been demanding a fairer slice of the spoils from the gems buried beneath its soil. De Beers recently agreed to increase Botswana's share. Under the new joint mining agreement, Botswana will get 30% of extracted rough stones, up from 25% in the old deal. Well, that will gradually increase to half of all diamonds De Beers mines over the next decade. The company will also invest millions of dollars to help develop the nation's economy. The partnership with De Beers produced nearly $3 billion in revenue for Botswana last year. President Mokwitsi Masisi has threatened to cut ties with the company if his nation did not receive a better share. He's increased pressure on De Beers by seeking to buy a stake in Belgian gem trader HB Antwerp, although the deal is yet to be finalised. Other nations like Sierra Leone, Tanzania and Uganda are also pushing to increase their profits from their resources. And now from Botswana's capital, we're joined by Keith Jeffries. He's a senior, former senior policy advisor at Botswana's Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. Good to have you with us. Keith is also the managing director of consultancy firm eConsult Botswana. So, Keith, is the new joint mining agreement a victory for Botswana or is it a win-win deal? I think it's a win-win it's a deal, although the, uh, some aspects of the deal uh, do mark uh, an improvement in the terms that uh, Botswana, government of Botswana gets. Um, I think at, at the expense of De Beers to some extent. But, but overall, there's, there's mutual benefit in the deal. All right. And you mentioned there it comes somewhat at the expense of De Beers. Why did De Beers budge again, we should say? Yes, I mean, it is again because, uh, you know, the government of Botswana has shown over many years its ability to um, extract uh, concessions from De Beers every time there's a set of negotiations. But I think for, for De Beers, um, what was critically important was getting assurance over the long-term mining leases. As you know, this was both a, a mining lease agreement and a sales and marketing agreement. And, and the mining leases have now been extended to out beyond uh, 2054 for the uh, or out to 2054 for the joint venture, uh, Debswana, which is a 50-50 JV between government and De Beers. And uh, that, um, those mines require very high levels of investment. Uh, so the long-term assurance over those mining leases, I think, is, is good for, for everybody involved in, in the JV. And uh, it was critical for De Beers to have that assurance. And that's why they, I think, were prepared to concede a little on some other aspects of the All right, let, let's talk a little bit about what each side gets out of this then. The government's saying the deal will help achieve the aspirations of the Botswana uh, population. Will it help achieve development goals? Well, you know, as, aspirations of the Botswana people, that, that, that's very vague. Um, and, and indeed, we still... Well, let, let's, let's try and make it a little the... less vague. Uh, what's the bottom line? Are people going to yeah. see some money out of this? Uh, I think uh, bottom line is no. Um, the, uh, I mean, there will be this Diamonds for Development Fund, which is going to be set up, funded by De Beers. Um, that may help to provide some finance for investment projects. We don't, we don't know the details. But in terms of fiscal revenues for government, uh, I don't think we're going to see much change as, as a result of this agreement. But we, we really need to see the details about you know, once the agreements are, are fully signed and negotiated. And where does it leave De Beers' market position then? In the, I mean, it's it, it has different aspects for De Beers. So one is they've still got access to the supply of diamonds from Debswana, which is their largest single source of supply. So it helps to maintain their very strong position in the in the diamond value chain. But they've had to give up a little bit of that. And over time, the share of diamonds going to the Botswana government's own company, Okamanko Diamond Company, 
uh, will increase uh, gradually over a 10 year period. But I think for De Beers, it means that they have uh, an assured access to supply from Debswana, which, as I say, is their largest single source of supply, which enables them to maintain their very strong position in the diamond world. All right. Thanks for sharing your perspective on that, Keith. Thank you very much. And that's our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. From the whole team here, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.